for Zoom. Start admitting people in. Hey, everybody. Hey, John. Hi, Jackie. Matt's here. Woohoo. Robert's here. Robert. I'm so happy. I'm so happy I recognize so many names. Hey, Dan. Good evening. Good hey. Jocelyn's here with me. Oh, great. Hey, John. Hi, Jocelyn. Hey, Peter. Good to see you. Everybody. Hey. Right. I wish I were I wish I were hiking with all of you right now, but this will have to do. Thanks for putting this on, Dan. I've read the White <laughs> Mountain before uh, spending a, a, a night up on Mount Washington last March. Oh, and fantastic. No, I always tried to, a mountaineering class and um, and it didn't uh, it didn't scare you away. No, it in okay. fact uh, <laughs> okay. it was perfect. It was perfect prep because it gave me a lot more history and culture. <laughs> Excellent. It was great. Thank you. Well, thank right. you for coming. I appreciate that. That means a lot. Who did you have the um, Who did you have your uh, your class with? Um, it was really run by the observatory, mm -hmm. um, and their edu one of their education people. Yep. But, um, Joe Lentini was the one who did the mountaineering class. Okay. So right. You probably know Joe from yeah. the Andrew Smog and Rescue. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's good. He's good. Yeah. He's a good guy. I, I really I really like Joe a lot. Yeah. Did he did he put you through the uh he put you through the ringer? No, he was a softy. Oh, okay. It, it was bad. We didn't, you know, we barely got off the mountain. And but we were <laughs> we were doing a lot of um like a, just training, like self-arrest and all that mm -hmm. with the ice axe and some fun things. So Excellent. It, was a, it was a really a great experience. Really cool um, being up there um, in early cool. March. Nice. Having, right. rye mice, having rye mice build off of you while you're standing up on top of the tower. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's always an experience, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's, it's better when you're, you know, only 10 feet away from the observatory door to have rye mice on you. Yeah, I felt secure. That's for sure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, ready? All right, ready. I'm ready. Is that everybody? All right. All right. Welcome, everybody, to a Freethinkers Corner event uh, live here with Dan Sesney. And uh, one thing before we start, I would like to ask everybody to turn your videos off and yeah. your microphones on mute, please. Uh, we're also doing this on Facebook Live. And then uh, so just in case somebody sneezes, you're going to be on Facebook Live as well. So just going to keep down confusion. So again, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, we have a lot of people here. If you would like to ask a question or you do have a comment either on Facebook Live or here on Zoom, uh, throw it down in the chat box there. And I'll uh, try my best to get it to, uh, to Dan. We do have a lot to cover. So Dan Sesney, most of you seem to uh, know him. Uh, he's a longtime journalist. Uh, he's worked for the uh, Mainline Times, Philadelphia Weekly, Christian Science Monitor, Appalachian Journal, New Hampshire Magazine, AMC Outdoors, Huffington Post. That's pretty impressive. Um, he's an author and he's a speaker here in New Hampshire. He's wrote several. Uh, he's written several of uh, uh, travel memoirs, uh, which would like uh, we'll get to a couple of those later. Uh, and he's also a member of the Appalachian Mountain Club 4,000 footer club did i say that right you said it right <laughs> so dan uh thank you for uh thank you for joining us thanks for having me chris thank you everybody it's really good to be here um i know i i recognize about half of the people in this room and i and i know some of you have been to my white mountain presentation before um so i have a little something special for you all tonight um that uh, Chris and I were talking about a little bit earlier about, I have a Cliff Notes version of my White Mountain chat, of, of my Mount Washington chat for you, maybe 15 uh, minutes or so. You'll, you'll still see plenty of slides. Um, but the last half of my talk today is gonna be looking forward. Um, I have quite a few projects coming up. Um, some of you that know me from Facebook uh, have seen uh, quite a bit of some of the things that I've been posting. And one of the projects even is a follow-up to the White Mountain. That's coming up uh, September 9th is 
going to be launching. So I want to talk a little bit about that. I have a couple of readings, short readings for you uh, of, of material that has never been read before. So um, that'll be special. And then I want to leave plenty of time um, to interview a little bit with Chris and to answer all of your questions. Uh, there's a lot of you and we have this whole Brady Bunch screen going on. So um, let me remind you that as I turn to the slides and I begin my presentation, the best way for you to see that would be to go up into the upper right hand corner of your screen into the view screen there and click on speaker view. And if you click on speaker view, the screen will open up uh, and you'll be able to see the, uh, the big picture of the slides as opposed to that little tiny box. And of course, um, Chris is going to be monitoring uh, questions in the chat room, both, both on Facebook and here uh, in, in our Zoom. So if you have any questions or if you don't want to wait to the end or whatever, uh, and you want to pop some questions in there for me or thoughts or whatever, uh, please feel free to ahead of time. And then uh, we'll, we'll quick and get to them uh, later on. And looking at some of these names, Chris, I'm, I'm feeling a little intimidated. I know Tom is with us. <laughs> Tom is a, an expert on, on the COG. And uh, Matt is with us. Matt is a, an expert hiker. Um, so uh, if any of you out there, if I if I say anything um, that I get just terribly, terribly wrong, uh, just wait to the end to tell me. OK, don't don't uh, I'm, you'll be tempted to interrupt me and and point out how terribly wrong I am. But um, wait till the end and, and we'll we'll do it that way. So um, let's um, let me let me begin with uh, let me begin with bringing up. Uh, my share screen here, and Chris, you can tell me if you can if I'm uh, if you're looking at my book cover. Yes, I am. All right, great. So let's begin. <clears throat> um, as a lot of you know, uh, the White Mountain is a year-long uh, study of uh, our favorite mountain, our backyard mountain, Mount Washington, uh, from January 1st through December 31st, 2017. I spent one year in or around or archiving or studying or chasing down um, uh, folks who are associated with Mount Washington in an attempt to figure out uh, what makes this mountain um, so special. Uh, we've been um, uh, you know, writing about and climbing uh, this mountain, at least the Europeans have for 400 years. There's a ton of literature um, and articles and newspapers and things and written and video. And uh, there's a lot of media about Mount Washington but it continues to be an incredibly popular place and, and, and continues to connect with us um, on, a, on, a, on an interesting level, given that it's uh, a mere 6,288 feet high. So I wanted to figure out uh, what made it special and why. And as a lot of you know, we were just talking earlier, as a lot of you know, uh, weather, of course, um, is one of those reasons. And, and I wanted to just start with a couple of photos. Uh, to show you um, some interesting scenes. As some of you know, this is the Weather Center up in the observatory in Mount Washington. This is from 2018. Uh, this is a bunch of the observers and um, some of the interns. They're taking a picture of what's called the haze chart. The haze chart is the device that's used to measure wind speed. Wind is a big deal, uh, maybe the biggest deal, up at the summit of Mount Washington. And uh, they are all taking a picture of the haze chart as it reaches a 181-mile-an-hour wind Gust. That is February, I think, 25th, 25th 24th, uh, somewhere around there, uh, 2018, uh, which set a record for uh, February since the uh, observatory has been has been setting records. So there's still uh, there's still uh, breaking records up there. And this was uh, just this past March, March 2nd, uh, 2021. Uh, you can see what the the, uh, the wind gusts and the wind chill and the air temperature was like up at the summit of Mount Washington. So um, if anything, the, uh, the records are being broken more frequently now uh, than they used to be. So we're gonna be talking quite a bit about weather. Uh, here's a nice shot. Uh, this is a, a shot that I really like from Mount Washington Observatory. Just some general shots here from the summit. Uh, this is from my stay up there. I spent a week up there uh, cooking for the observers back in April of 2017. This is a, my first sunrise from the summit of Mount Washington. I never uh, stayed overnight up there. I woke up on the first morning uh, to this beautiful scene. Now I am trying to hit your ride on the cog. Uh, the cog would not pick me up for some reason, uh, but uh, we'll be talking about the cog quite a bit as well. Um, let's go back to the very beginning. <clears throat> like I said, Cliff Notes version, right? So 
1642, a guy by the name of Darby Field. He's a merchant um, and a uh, ferry operator out of the Dover, Durham area. He becomes the first European that we know of to summit Mount Washington. Um, Darby thought that there was gold and diamonds uh, up uh, at, the, at those sparkling white summits. Uh, so he went up twice um, that year. Uh, there was not gold and diamonds uh, at the summit of those uh, sparkling mountains, of course. Uh, over the course of the next uh, 125 or so years, 150 years, not a whole lot in the way of tourism happens. There are some first settlers. The Crawfords are up there. Uh, some early roads are built, the Wileys, of course. And then the 1820s, um, this begins to happen. This is a Thomas Cole painting from 1826. It's called A View of the White Mountains. That is Mount Washington in the background. <clears throat> um, this painting, uh, Thomas Cole and uh, a lot of his... Um, um, uh, a, a lot of his students and painters like him uh, created the White Mountain School of Art. Um, and they began painting uh, going up into the White Mountains into the, in the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s. Um, oops, am I, I'm looking, um, oh, there I am. Uh, and started bringing back images like this. And this was really sort of the beginning of modern tourism as we know it in the White Mountains. Uh, I think of these guys as sort of the um, the Instagrammers or the YouTubers of the day, right? If Thomas posted this painting on Instagram, he'd get, you know, 150,000 likes and, and the painting would go viral. And people in uh, the sort of private art galleries and art galleries around the country, this painting was exhibited in Boston and Philadelphia and um, in San Francisco and so forth, um, began looking at, at these images and thinking, well, if a, uh, uh, you know, an, an, a British born painter can go up into the White Mountains for a couple of weeks and come back with images like this and, and, and not die uh, while doing it, uh, then maybe I can too. And that really was the beginning of, modern tour, of the modern tourist age, tourism age, as we know it. So one of the things that I wanted to do for my book was to kind of get into the heads of these painters to sort of leave my medium behind and try to see the mountains um, through texture and color and painting. Uh, so I spent a, a, a couple of weeks with um, my, uh, my mentor, that's the fellow back there. His name is Byron Carr. He's a landscape painter. Um, and he and a, a, a group of, of his um, uh, painter, uh, painters, uh, fellow painters up there in Bartlett and Jefferson area sort of took me under their wing and they taught me for a couple of weeks. Um, and uh, I learned uh, quite a bit. I learned to see uh, with eyes uh, besides words, you know, um, which was an interesting thing for me to do. But it also showed me that I should probably keep my day job because it was very, very hard for me. I don't think I picked a, had picked up a, a painting, a, you know, a paintbrush since probably elementary school. Um, but I did learn a lot uh, 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 about the history of art and, and how this began bringing folks into the White Mountains. Uh, here we are uh, south of Mount Washington today. This is from uh, near the summit of Mount Monroe. There's lakes of the clouds down there. And we can begin with uh, Old Pepper Sass. Um, so uh, let's let's do a little thing on the Cog Railway, um, something which probably a lot of you have, have driven up the mountain um, uh, and continue to do so if Tom is still with us. Uh, this is Old Pepper Sass, Sylvester Marsh. There's a great museum down in Marshfield Station on the history of the cog. And when I began writing about the cog, I went to the station. I wanted to, that's the first place that I went was the museum. Uh, there's an enormous amount and a wonderful amount of um, information down there on how the cog works and on the history of the cog. Uh, uh, it's an incredible invention. I go into it in some detail in the book. I'll be happy to talk with you about it um, after the, the, uh, uh, the presentation. But what I wanted to bring up um, was one particular event that really stuck with me. And that is uh, Sylvester Marsh himself um, led this incredibly interesting life. He was sort of the Forrest Gump of the industrial era uh, of the mid 19th of the of the 19th century, and it seemed like wherever he went, um, something important was happening in sort of the industrial world or industrial history. Um, and this is old Pepper Sass, 1866. It was built. It was designed specifically to build the tracks to get to the summit of the mountain. And one of the interesting um, things, one of the thing, interesting things I found is because I have a, a daughter myself, as you, you all I'm sure know, is that Old Pepper Sass was originally named Hero. Um, Sylvester brought his daughter uh, Hattie to the work site in 1867. Uh, Hattie was a was a unusual girl for the time. She loved exotic food or what was considered exotic at the time, and she loved hot and spicy food. 
pepper sauce was a, a popular condiment of the time. And it came in a bottle that looked exactly like uh, that boiler on, uh, on Hero. And uh, Hattie took one look at, uh, at Hero and said in a very thick, her thick Boston accent, uh, Daddy, uh, your engine looks like a pepper sass bottle. Uh, and Sylvester immediately changed the name to old pepper sass. You can still see pepper sass today. It's in the train yard at the COG. And uh, speaking of my daughter, there she is. Uh, they do a steampunk festival. I know they didn't do it last year. I'm not sure if they're doing it this year, uh, but it, that is free and it's cool. And she dressed herself as a Victorian, uh, um, uh, you know, a, a, a Victorian engineer there, uh, complete in boots that she can't walk in, but uh, she looks darn cute. And there's Sylvester himself. So Sylvester was a local boy born in Campton. Um, uh, on a farm in Campton, when he was a teenager, he walked down to Boston. He was one of the very first uh, meat and grain and flour vendors in a brand new market that had just opened up in Boston called Quincy Market. Um, he cut his teeth there, uh, moved eventually uh, to Chicago via uh, Ohio and Buffalo and some other areas. He eventually landed in Chicago in 1833, in the same year that Chicago uh, was actually um, well, uh, the 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 the, uh, uh, the the Chicago was formed when Sh uh, Sylvester arrived in Chicago. There was about 250 or so people living there. Um, he walked about a quarter mile up the Chicago River. He built a meat pro meat grain and flour processing plant along the Chicago River, and he began to make money. He made money. He lost money. He made money uh, until the 1840s or so when he moved to Buffalo, New York. And this is a shot of the Erie Canal in Buffalo, New York. Uh, you can see the Reed grain elevator right there. And right next to that is the uh, Marsh Caloric grain dryer. Uh, Sylvester's made his millions um, uh, built on this thing, on the Caloric grain dryer. Uh, he was losing a lot of money. Um, the grain had to be transferred from the Great Lakes to the Erie Canal, and it tended to sit there and rot. So he would lose a lot of his, his product. So he invented this grain dryer. Uh, in order to get his product over the Erie Canal, down the Hudson and into New York and Boston, where he was originally from. Um, Buffalo at the time had about 40 or so of these enormous grain elevators working. Uh, by the time Sylvester retired uh, and moved back to New England, uh, he was one of the wealthiest men in the country. And of the 40, about 35 of these grain elevators had one of uh, Sylvester's uh, caloric grain dryers working in them. So Sylvester moves back to New England and he decides to retire. Now, when he was in Boston, or I'm sorry, in Chicago, and when he uh, built his meat processing plant, he uh, was sued. Uh, this is the story that I was telling you about earlier. This is the story that sort of got me interested in Sylvester to begin with. He was actually sued. Um, There's a lot of land grab lawsuits that were going on there. So it was a land lawsuit. It was a case called the Sandbar case. Um, there was no district court in Chicago until 1860. So flash forward to 1860, the COG is already up and running, or, or I'm sorry, 18, um, uh, 18, uh, 1869, I apologize. Uh, the COG is already up and running. Uh, Sylvester is uh, uh, um, has to reach back into, Il or, hold on, hold on, let me, let me get the dates right here. So uh, in 1860, uh, Sylvester is back in New England. Um, he's already beginning uh, um, uh, putting together the plans to build the Cog Railway, and he's sued. And he has to reach back into Illinois in order to defend himself in this case called the Sandbar case. Now, Sylvester has a lot of money. He can hire any lawyer that he wants. So he goes and he finds the best lawyer working in Illinois uh, in 1860. Who is the best lawyer working in Illinois in 1860? A fellow by the name of Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln defends Sylvester and wins that case for him, and they become lifelong friends, or at least friends for the next five years or so. So flash forward to 1869, Sylvester's cog is running now, um, and he's having some trouble selling tickets. Uh, this is the fall of 1869. Uh, that costs $3 to ride to drive up the cog. It's a little bit out of the way. Um, and keep in mind, Sylvester at the time is sort of like the Elon Musk of the day, right? He's, he's sort of this eccentric inventor. And a lot of people don't know how the cog works. 
um, and they're a little bit un unsure of buying a ticket, of taking that ride. So Sylvester, using the connections that he made uh, through his uh, friendship with Abraham Lincoln, reaches down into Washington, convinces a very popular sitting president, Ulysses S. Grant, that's him in that picture there, at the Tip Top House holding the giant hat, convinces Grant to take a uh, vacation up in northern New Hampshire, which Grant does. He rides to the summit of the mountain. The press asks the president what he thinks of the COG railway. And the president uh, tells the press that not only is the COG safe, but it's one of the finest tourist attractions he's ever ridden on. And the next day, the line for tickets to uh, Sylvester's COG wrapped around the ticket window. Sylvester was a, was a pretty savvy businessman. Here we are today. Uh, here's one of the steamers. And there's one of the biodiesel engines that the COG uses. Let's move on to the observatory, 1932, um, uh, formed by four guys, uh, some of whose names you probably recognize, Joe Dodge, of course, everybody would, would recognize. Um, that is Alex McKenzie up at the, at the roof of the observatory. That's probably Sal Pagliuca down at the instrumentation box. This picture is probably from around 1935 or so. Everybody knows that the observatory uh, is, has been made famous and there's uh, Joe Dodge and Alex McKenzie inside the observatory. Um, Joe Dodge uh, micromanaging like he usually did. Um, everybody knows that uh, the big wind happened on, uh, what was it, April, again, help me out here, Tom, April 17th, April, April 12th, 1934, uh, 231 mile an hour wind gust. <clears throat> Today, the observatory is uh, the observatory today was built uh, 1979, 1980. Um, they was built to withstand wind gusts of 350 miles an hour. Uh, the uh, every observer and um, uh, uh, every observer and scientist who was worked up at the observatory would like nothing better than to test that theory, uh, but they haven't gotten a 350 mile an hour gust yet. There's uh, the tower where most of the instrumentation is. You can see one of the observers up there at the top. And there was my ride. So in um, April of 2017, I was uh, selected as a volunteer. Some of you um, have been volunteers up at the observatory. They have an amazing program up there where you can go uh, stay up there for a week. Um, I, you have to go in the summer first. Um, they waived that requirement for me, uh, thankfully. Um, then up we went uh, on, the, um, on the snowcat here. Is a bombardier snowcat, fits about you know, 12, 13 people in there. And this is how the observers get up and down. They're a week on and a week off. Uh, that's how they run their schedule. And when I was selected for this um, program, when they gave me the go ahead, uh, my wife was horrified uh, by this, uh, not because she feared for my safety, but because one of the jobs that you have to do when you're up there is you have to cook for the observers. Um, I am a dreadful cook. Um, that's why they sent me up there with a fellow by the name of John Donovan. Uh, John is a, a big plays a big role in the book. He's a big character in the book. He's a big character. And um, John was basically the cook while uh, we were up there. And uh, uh, John told me what to do. And I did it. I, I ended up being John sous chef while I was up there. Uh, but nobody starved uh, and they didn't kick me out. So I guess I did OK. Here's a little tour of the inside. Here's the kitchen area, uh, the, the eating, the sitting and dining area. Uh, the bunkhouses, there's, uh, I was actually in the Alex McKenzie uh, bunkhouse. They're all named after the founders. I got at the Alex uh, McKenzie bunkhouse, which really thrilled me because Alex plays a big part in the book. Uh, there's the lounge where we can sit and relax. We watched Young Frankenstein while we were up there. That was, and made brownies. That was a memorable evening. And there I am with John. Um, during the time, the week that I was up there, we experienced a 110 mile an hour gust of wind. That was the highest gust that we experienced during the week that I was up there. And this is John and I coming in from about 10 or so minutes outside in sustained winds of about 87, 80, 87 miles an hour, I believe it was. You can see the, uh, um, the whites on our, the white on our parka, that's actually rye mice that had begun to form on our jackets in just the 10 or 15 minutes that we were out there. Um, this is Marty. Um, not a presentation goes by that uh, someone doesn't ask me about the mascots of Mount Washington, of the observatory. Since 1932, the observatory has had cat mascots up at the summit. Marty is the latest. Marty unfortunately passed away uh, about a month and a half ago. Uh, the observatory is currently in the middle of um, interviews. 
um, and reach outs for Marty's uh, uh, replacement. But Marty was a, a popular one. He'd been up there since 2008 and everybody knew Marty and everybody loved Marty. And uh, in the new book coming out uh, in September, I actually, there's a whole chapter uh, dedicated to history of the cat mascots up at the summit of Mount Washington. There I am with my daughter. Uh, she went up there the first time when she was two and a half. Um, and uh, she, she, I took her as often as I could during the year that I was uh, uh, working up there and learning up there. Um, I was up there so often, in fact, that I recall her, um, I recall leaving the house one af one morning, um, telling her that I was going to work, and she said, "Oh, you're going, you're going, you're going to the top of the mountain." Um, and boy, do I ever wish my my office was at the top of the mountain, huh? So the auto road. Uh, is another aspect of the uh, mountain that's an important one. The um, oldest man-made tourist attraction in the United States. Uh, for the longest time, it was, uh, um, you know, just a carriage road, basically. And then here's a shot from about 1905. You can see uh, cars and horses going up at the same time. There's uh, uh, an old jalopy coming around the, uh, the, uh, the lower one of the uh, hairpins down the Cragway hairpin. And there's a rally car. Um, I put uh, these shots in because I want to mention, I'm often asked if there's anything in that year that I didn't do uh, on, on Mount Washington. And there is one thing uh, every year or every couple of years, um, the Mount Washington uh, Auto Road holds an honest to goodness uh, car race up the mountain. In 2017, they held one. Um, Back in the day, in this picture, this picture is from the 30s, for example, um, these race car drivers were, were, were getting up the mountain in, um, you know, 20, 19, 18 minutes. That was considered um, incredibly suicidally, insanely fast uh, back then. In 2017, a fellow by the name of Travis Pastrani uh, drove a, a souped up uh, Subaru up the mountain in five minutes and 44 seconds. Five minutes and 44 seconds. There he is. Um, in his car coming around that same Cragway turn. Um, he um, he uh, <laughs> drifted the Cragway turn, I'm told, at about 55 miles an hour. So that's quite a feat. You can see uh, there's a camera at the roof of the car there. So if you go to, if you Google uh, Mount Washington Auto Road Records or Travis or something like that, uh, you can go to, I think it's on Vimeo. Vimeo. Um, you can actually white knuckle the entire five minutes and 44 seconds of that uh, record setting drive up the mountain. Uh, they are holding the auto race again this year, by the way. And uh, Travis is, uh, is, is returning. Uh, uh, I guess he has some specialized Subaru this time. He's gonna attempt to beat that five minutes and 44 seconds. So uh, they would not let me do this. Um, this is the one thing that I wanted to do, uh, much to my chagrin um, and my wife's relief, they would not allow me in one of those cars. Um, they said it was because, you know, my 185 pounds would, would mess up the timing and the driver um, in some of these cars. I suspect it was probably because it would be my screaming that would mess up the timing of some of these drivers, but they're being nice to me. But I did do this and you can too. I think the, um, I think the snow shuttle is still running if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think the auto road is open yet, but I think the snow shuttle is still running. You can get up to above tree line uh, there. And um, you can, you know, you, they, you get out, you get above tree line, you get some great views and you can um, walk back down or snowshoe back down like I was doing here or take the shuttle back down. So that's a, an option you, you still have available to you, I think, this year. What I did take part in was the road race, the foot race. Uh, <clears throat> one of the probably the most popular event on Mount Washington. Runners from all over the world uh, take part in a lottery. Um, a thousand, uh, they allow a thousand people in this race each year. Um, it is an incredibly hard race. Uh, as you all probably know, there's no down on Mount Washington. Um, you are running up the entire seven and a half or so miles. And uh, um, uh, it is considered an, an elite road race. So um, they knew that I was writing this book, so they, I, I managed to snag a, uh, uh, a bib for this race, and I just had to figure out what I was going to do. I am not, by any stretch of the imagination, uh, except maybe in my own head, um, any sort of an elite anything, particularly an elite runner. So um, 
I needed to figure out a way to cover this in a way that would be interesting and, and also, you know, not give me a heart attack. And I figured that out when I found this fella. Uh, this is George Entweiler, who became a great friend. Um, he, since the 80s, has been coming up uh, to run this road race. He lives in State College, Pennsylvania. Um, he comes up with his family. His family is his team. Um, and George has run this race for years and years and years. Um, and I was honored in 2017 to, to be on his team uh, to help George get up the mountain. George is extraordinary in a lot of ways. But in particular, uh, George is amazing because in 2017, when he was running this race, he was 97 years old. You can see his bib down there. He ran the race in four minutes and five, four hours and five minutes, uh, which is a pretty darn good time for anybody to say anything, say nothing about a nearly 100 year old. He came back in 2018, ran the race in four hours and four minutes. He shaved one minute off his time. So he's getting older and he's getting faster. Um, he did not. He came back in 2019. Uh, he did not make it. Um, there was pretty strong winds up at the top. So he got up to the six mile mark of all places, uh, very close to the summit. Uh, but he was forced to turn around at 99 years old. He had planned to come back in 2020 as the only 100 year old to ever run this race. Uh, but of course, COVID put the kibosh on that. And um, I don't know whether or not he's coming back this year. Um, he, he did suffer a little bit of a knee injury. Um, and, you know, he's 101 years old. So uh, um, if he does uh, come back, though, that is, going to be, that is going to be the race to see. He does a lot of charity work in his spare time. Um, and uh, in 2018, um, he became the oldest man to repel down a 10-plus story building. There he is in State College, Pennsylvania setting more records. He got to the bottom of this particular, uh, this particular stunt and was told that there had been a woman, a 104-year-old woman, who had done the same thing a few years ago. Uh, so George has now determined that he is going to live to be 105 in order to break her record. And there he is uh, rappelling down that building. And I dedicate a whole chapter uh, in the book to George um, and it was a, it was a, a really a, a, probably the high point for me of that entire year. Um, really quick, I want to talk a little bit about Alton Weagle. Alton Weagle Day is celebrated by the Auto Road. Alton Weagle, currently, here he is in the 1920s in his hometown of uh, Stark, New Hampshire. Alton Weagle is the current record holder, uh, Mount Washington climbing record holder. He holds about 30 records on Mount Washington, um, including uh, climbing the mountain backwards, on his hands and knees, uh, jumping, um, blindfolded. Uh, he raced the cog up the mountain six years in a row, something like that, and he won each time. His most, One of his most famous records is pushing a wheelbarrow full of sugar up the auto road all the way to the summit without putting it down. So um, some of those records are going to be hard to beat, and, and, and why would you beat them anyway? So I took part in this in 2017. Uh, I uh, decided to, uh, to make an attempt at being the first person to read poetry out loud all the way up the mountain while climbing the mountain. Um, I was going to read uh, uh, Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. That's one of my, my favorite poets and one of my favorite uh, pieces of poetry. This is Mary Slavatsky. Mary is a seamstress in Manchester, New Hampshire, uh, who, needed, who I employed to turn me into Walt Whitman. And there she is with the costume that I used uh, on my attempt. I think it was the first time that I cosplayed, on, you know, since I was like 12 or something like that. And there I am uh, with, the, uh, with the costume she made and the image of Walt that I gave her. Um, it's a really fun event. Uh, people do all sorts of things. Bigfoot runs and Hot Dog Man was there. Uh, Cookie Monster and Three Cookies. And uh, Star Wars, of course. Um, Alton is a really interesting character. Alton, even after he stopped uh, setting Mount Washington records, he continued setting records. That's simply what he did for his whole life. He was the first part of the first couple. There he is with Cora uh, to get married on the Cog Railway. This happened in 1955. Uh, they even have they they renamed the Cog the Honeymoon Special for that particular trip. Um, Alton uh, is in Guinness Book of World Records twice um, for he is the drummer 
uh, in the world's uh, largest town, um, town square contra dance that happened in Keene. And he was also the referee uh, for the longest professional horseshoe match in professional play in the Keene uh, Horseshoe Society. This is 1967, somewhere around there. Um, my, uh, he, well, by the time Alton passed away, he was the New Hampshire record holder uh, for donating blood. And my favorite record of all time of Alton's is that he holds the record for most pies baked at the summit of Mount Monadnock. Most pies baked at the summit of Mount Monadnock. He baked 37 pies in one day. Um, he uh, carried the, uh, the stove up himself and he spent the whole day baking pies. So uh, who's going to beat that record? So here's the class of 2017. Uh, my class buddy, the elf, ran with me. He he kicked my butt up the mountain. He got that up there way before me. Um, and there's Nate. He uh, unicycled up. Well, he didn't actually unicycle all the way up, let's just say. Um, there I am at about the 5,000 foot mark. It's five mile mark. And there I am uh, finishing leaves of grass at the summit. So I am a record holder. So if any of you wish to... Uh, to, to beat my record, um, I can get that time for you and you can, you can go and do that. I'm gonna actually stop share for a second um, and come back to the full screen. Um, that's the first part of, of my program. And I just wanted to take five minutes to see if anybody had any questions. I want to check in with, uh, you know, with, uh, with, Ron, with Tom to make sure I got all my information right. Um, and uh, and <laughs> he's laughing and see if, uh, See if there's any quick questions before I before I move forward on to other things. I what do you think? For you. What do y'all think? Yes, go ahead. I got a question for you. So, uh, your book, The White Mountain, uh, it won the 2019 New Hampshire Writers Project Award for outstanding work of nonfiction, and it also won the People's Choice Award for nonfiction that year as well. What is it that drew you to Mount Washington, the White Mountains in general? um mount washington specifically and why write nonfiction about it versus fiction yeah well thanks um for mentioning that i i'm so honored by that actually it was um yeah i i you know it was, it was awesome to get that award from uh, the writers project which is an incredible organization um but to actually win the people's choice award as well that's that was I cried about that. That was um, that was truly amazing. Um, so why did I write this book? I wanted to write this book 20 years ago when I moved to New Hampshire, but I couldn't. Um, and the reason that I couldn't uh, requires some some explanation. I I was born and raised in Buffalo, New York. That's where I got that's where I was educated, and that's where I got my start in journalism. And um, you know, I've had a 25 year career in journalism, um, working for the Associated Press and for Buffalo News and Buffalo Spree and a bunch of other papers in between. And but, um, you know, wherever I lived um, was, you know, flat. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's not a lot of mountains in, in Buffalo or Philadelphia or New Jersey. Um, so moving to New England was from New Jersey, of all places, was the real culture shock for me. And uh, you know, I mean, obviously I've seen mountains, but to actually live in a place where the culture is um, sort of wrapped around the outdoor life, which is how it is in New Hampshire, was very new for me. So I remember um, I, uh, when I, when I, when I first moved to New Hampshire, I was working for the union leader and I was doing feature, some feature writing for the union leader. And they gave us a um, you know, every week or so, we had to come up with one or two features on our own. I was living down in Derry at the time, and I caught wind of uh, this firefighter out of London, Derry. His name is Jim Gagney, who was preparing to um, climb Mount McKinley in Alaska. It's now called Denali Mountain, but back then it was Mount McKinley in Alaska. And he was doing this uh, as a training for an, an eventual Mount Everest climb. And I did a story on Jim. His name was Jim. And he became a friend and he became one of my mentors. And at some point, um, you know, during this, yeah, Jim Gagney, of course, yeah. And at some point during this story, um, he said to me, you know, when I come back from Alaska, if you want to go on a hike, I'll take you up to the White Mountains. We'll, we'll go hiking. And to me, hiking was, 
you know, like the Jersey Shore, Atlantic City, the Jersey, you know, that was, that was, I'd, I'd hike in New Jersey, you know, um, along the beach. So I said, yeah, sure. You know, I didn't know anybody and Jim wanted to take me hiking. So that was cool. So he came back from Alaska. Um, he called me up and he said, hey, have you, um, have you ever, have you heard of the old man on the mountain? This was 2001, 2000, something like that. And I said, no, who's that? I didn't, I had no idea who the old man on the mountain was. And he said, well, I'm going to take you to meet him. And I said, okay, sure. What do I need? <laughs> he said, just bring boots and a lunch. <laughs> so off we went. And uh, Jim knew the caretakers, the, the team that took care of the, the old man on the mountain uh, back in the day. And um, he took me up the caretaker route, which is basically a hand over foot climb up can the Cannon Mountain wall. This was my first hike. I never hiked before. Um, so, you know, I get about halfway up that and, uh, I, I thought I, I was convinced that he was a serial killer and that he was, that I was going to die of a heart attack halfway up that mountain. And he was just going to bury my body and then go find the next, his next victim. Um, but we eventually got up there. Um, and, uh, there I was my first hike in the white mountains, um, sitting with my legs, uh, sitting on the old man's forehead on the rock on the old man's forehead with my legs dangling over um, Franconia Notch, my first hike. And, uh, and I knew that was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. You know? um, and we got down off of that hike. Um, I went home. I couldn't move for the next five days or so. I, I actually called Jim the next morning and I said, Jim, that was fantastic, but you have to come and make me lunch because I can't get out of bed. <laughs> I'm so exhausted. And, you know, he told me to stop being a wimp and asked me what mountain I want to climb next. And I said, well, what's the highest mountain? And he said, Mount Washington. And I said, OK, let's do that one next. So we did. Um, so a couple of weeks later, um, this was early May. So it was still full winter gear. Um, he loaned me one, all of his winter gear. Um, he took me out on a practice run for, you know, for uh, self-arresting and how to use crampons, the whole thing. Like, literally, I'd never even seen the, this equipment before. We left in the dark. Um, we summited Mount Washington and I got back in the dark. And uh, it was and from that moment, I wanted to write a book about Mount Washington. I couldn't because uh, I didn't have the chops yet. I didn't have the experience in New England. I wasn't really part of the hiking community. Um, I wasn't a journalist for long enough to be able to ask the COG and the Auto Road for, for permission to use their archives. Remember, for, for my book, For the White Mountain, uh, the AMC, the COG Railway, the Observatory, and the Mount Washington Auto Road all gave me um, unfettered access, not, not only to their organization, but to their archives for a full year. So, you know, to ask, to make that ask, I needed to have some books and some experience behind me. So um, it took, uh, you know, 15 years before I was able to, to put together the book that I wanted to put together. So that's a really long answer. Sorry about that. <laughs> that that's was really fascinating. Yeah. Uh, many, many years ago when I was a kid, my parents took, uh, you know, drove the Yada Road. My father drove us up to the top of Mount Washington. That was the first time I was up there. I was early teens, I think. And so, of course, you know, I have kids now and at least about a decade or so ago, we went camping up in uh, North Conway. I said, you know, we're here. We have to drive up the Mount Washington. I have to take my kids. <laughs> and so I did. And um, it was quite the different experience driving than being driven up there. Um, but when we did get to the top, though, we saw all, uh, a lot of people, a lot of hikers, and they had the big, um, the big uh, uh, cafe and, and everything up there, and just tons of people around there. Is that where you got some of your stories from? Did you ever interview any of those hikers uh, for your book? Yeah, very specifically, actually. So they do this thing, this yearly thing, and some of the people who are here with us today participate in it, um, called Seek the Peak. And once a year, hikers from all over the world sort of descend on the presidentials and on Mount Washington, and they, they hike it from every different direction. Um, and this is in the summer, um, and they raise money for the observatory. It's a fundraiser for the observatory. So literally thousands of hikers uh, of all different ages and, and abilities uh, descend on this mountain. And at the same time, uh, the, the auto road is open. Uh, so there's shuttles running. Uh, the cog is open. 
um, you know, there's overnights at the huts. So it's if you like if you don't like people, if you <laughs> if you're looking for solitude, it is not a good day to be there. Uh, but I wanted to be there. So I actually um, went to the top of the mountain um, that morning before all the hikers started arriving. And I spent the whole day from seven in the morning till, you know, six o'clock at night just interviewing hikers and doing nothing else but interviewing hikers. And so many of the stories um, from from the book have come out of those experiences. I, I, that's where I met um, Curly Purzell, who's one of the oldest redliners um, in the AMC. She's 70 something years old and she's, you know, uh, I'm sorry, not the oldest redline, the oldest, um, she's hiked all the 4,000 footers over, over 70 years old when she reached 70 years old. Um, so I just met these person after person. I actually participated in a wedding while I was up there, there was a, a couple who climbed, uh, Amy and Mark, and they allowed me to actually be part of the wedding party okay. as they were getting married at the summit. So, yeah, that was my my main day was that was um, just be up there, stand by the door with my notebooks um, and whoever walked in that looked interesting. Um, I would come up and I would just talk to and everybody has a story. Everybody has, a you know, some people climb it because they're fighting cancer. You know, some people climb it. Um, because, because they, you know, they're climbing in memory of someone who, who passed away. I met one hiker who was bringing her uncle's ashes up to the summit. I met another hiker who was bringing her dog's ashes up to the summit, you know? So, um, there's this incredible array of stories, um, in just the day that I was up there. So that was, that was one of the, that was an important day for me. I think it, I dedicate a whole chapter to just that day in the book. What was the most interesting story, most fascinating story that somebody told you? Oh my gosh. <clears throat> Where do I start? Um, well, I love the observer's stories. Um, you know, the observer, uh, um, one of the observers, Adam told me this, uh, uh, geez, I, when I think about it, it's not, it's not a very upbeat story, <laughs> but it's a, uh, you know, the observers are, are always encountering wildlife up there. And one of them told me this, um, story they every hour on the hour they have to come out and they do they do weather, weather measurements so um even like at one in the morning two in the morning on the hour they're outside um taking their readings so uh, they one of them told me the story about um encountering you know they open the door to the tower and they're not five feet from them at two o'clock in the morning was this enormous bull moose standing out on the observatory deck and the moose was as scared of the observer, as you can imagine, as the observer was of the moose of encountering him at two in the morning. And he just bolted straight up off the observatory platform down to the rocks below. Um, and the observatory team had a, like a couple hours to actually get a truck up there um, to cart the, the, the moose off the mountain before the tourists started arriving. Jeez. So, so <laughs> part of the... Uh, you know, the unknown work that they do up there. Um, let's see. Well, Mark, Mark and Amy had an incredible story. Uh, they um, they grew up down in, um, in uh, I forget where in Massachusetts, down in Amherst, Massachusetts. Um, they went, uh, they, they went to the same school together. Um, they were belonged to the same church together. Um, they uh, worked at, at retail stores just a couple of blocks from each other, but they never knew each other. They never met. Uh, they both signed up to a, um, some online dating site. And the very first hit that each of them got was each other. And it turns out they lived uh, about 300 feet from each other oh, wow. for, the, for their whole lives. So uh, talk about the, you know, the mountain bringing two people together. So the, the list of stories like that goes on and on. What's the most scariest, the scariest story that somebody told you be it you know well obviously the moose one could be at two o'clock in the morning pretty That's scary, scary but sure. uh, but you know almost falling off one of the cliffs or running into other wild what was the scared you as they were telling you um the uh the observers up there like to like to tell a lot of ghost stories and uh, particularly lizzie Bourne is a, is a big popular one um, but I, I know what you're saying as as far as uh, as far as climbing goes i you know i i didn't really run into um, off the mountain, you know, privately, I, I ran into a lot of folks who, who, who were telling me sort of crazy stories about like, just barely getting off them, you know, during getting caught on the mountain during a lightning storm, and, you know, having to toss away their, their ice axes and their metal poles and like, 
cowering on their backpacks, you know, while this storm swept over the top of the mountain. I mean, I can't think of it. <laughs> I mean, that's anything scarier that's than that. Scary. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, you know, there was um, there's a there was a plane crash on the mountain that a lot of people don't realize it happened just off uh, off uh, um, uh, near um, um, not on the not on the summit itself, uh, but near the summit. Uh, so that was a pretty scary story. Um, you know, the cog, the, the, the cog uh, accident that happened in the 1960s, that is, that still plays a, a, a huge role uh, in the, in the sort of memory process uh, of a lot of people who lived in New Hampshire, um, because that involved a, a lot of rescue workers and so forth. Um, so, you know, I'll, um, oh, there's one. Okay. D uh, during the, the year that I was there, I wasn't involved in this. I wasn't there at the time, but uh, 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 there was a motorcycle. So th there was a, a woman on a motorcycle. Uh, I hope I'm getting the story right, but there's a woman on a motorcycle who, um, as you know, you're, you're talking about driving up the mountain. It could be, you know, driving. It's one thing to be a passenger. It's another thing to drive up that, up, up that road. And she became so scared um, on the way down at some point on the way down that she froze. She literally froze in the middle of the road blocking traffic and she couldn't get off her bike. She, she wouldn't, she was unable to get off her bike. So they actually had to send uh, a rescue team up to talk her off her bike. So she, so she could, they could help her down off of the mountain and move the bike out of the road. Can you imagine how, I mean, being that terrified to, to, you know, they had to close the road. It was like this whole, this whole thing. So um, yeah, you never know. You never know what, you no, know, you never know what's going to affect you up on that mountain yeah I, I i looked one time in my side view mirror when you're going around one of the going up uh and you're right on the edge and i swear there was maybe inches from my tire to the cliff and i never looked in the side view mirror again the whole <laughs> or is it half hour or so i just because they give you that uh cd there where and they they takes a half hour to get to yeah. the top so I just, nope just focus on the cd watch the road <laughs> do the path you know whatever um so have you ever thought of taking some of those stories and turning them into some sort of um, fiction or uh, yeah, fiction book, be it um, maybe like a mystery or a thriller or, or just a, just a contemporary type novel. Yeah. I, um, no, I, I don't, I don't think I'm a very good fiction writer. <laughs> I, I just, it's not like, it's like, it's, I like writing it. I mean, I have a collection of short stories, as you know, and I have a, a poetry collection out as well. And I and for those of you that follow me on social media, you know that I write quite a bit of poetry. Um, but I, um, it is just not my wheelhouse. I just don't. I don't feel a, the level of same level of comfort as I do um, telling true stories, telling actual stories. Is that because of your journalistic background? Yeah, and I was going to say, and I think that has everything to do with the fact that for thirty years I was I was I wrote feature stories. That was that was what I did and what I loved. And I I I feel like there's so there's so many stories to be real stories or real people to be told that um, I, I'd almost be doing them a disservice to 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 not to make to make a story up, you know, you know, and, and, um, uh, you know, that said, I'm an English lit major. That was, that's what my degree is in. So, you know, I, the, I know the, the function and the infrastructure of fiction. I know, I know how to critique it. Um, you know, I know how to do reviews. I know, I know what makes a classic, a classic. So, um, when I write my, when I do write my, my stories, I, I try to have an element of, uh, you know, sort of narrative nonfiction in there. You know, I want it to be, I, I want, when you're reading my books, I, I want people to forget that they're reading nonfiction. Does, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You know, um, so I, I try to apply that. I don't know how successful I always am, but, but I, I very much try to tell a story within the framework of nonfiction. So there is part of that. But, um, you know, life's short and, you know, you got to you got to stick with uh, what you know. So I'm going to stick with what I know. And I'm really good. I'm, re I'm good at research. You know, I'm good at research and and interviewing. And, and I consider that a strong point. So um, I uh, uh, as long as uh, as long as I'm able, um, you know, I like I like telling 
I like telling the, the stories of, of real people. Well, I know you want you have another short presentation yeah. about it to give, but before I have one more quick question. Yeah. Have any of the cats ever escaped? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, the history of cat mascots at uh, the summit of Mount Washington, I could probably write a book just about that. Um, there's been dozens and dozens of them. If you look at the logs from the 1930s and 1940s, um, you see references literally to 13, 14, 16 cats up at the summit. Um, so many, in fact, that oftentimes the observers don't don't know one from the other. It's just cat armies that are living up there with them. Um, there are endless stories of um, cats going in. Since the beginning, the observatory has treated the cat mascots as fellow observers, right? They come and go as they please. That is, that is how they've treated them. If they want to stay in, they stay in. If they want to go out, they go out. Um, and, you know, they're on their own. So there's a lot of stories of cats leaving the observatory and never being seen again. <laughs> oh, no. But there's also a lot of stories of cats leaving the observatory and, and coming back a month later. <laughs> you know, wow. just showing up, looking for food, you know? I mean, if cats could talk, right? What an adventure that would have been. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of those stories. Um, uh, there's a lot of favorites. Eric uh, Pinder, uh, one of the observers from the 90s wrote a kid's book, as you know, Above the Clouds, about uh, Marty's predecessor, Nin, um, among, uh, Above the Clouds, that's the name of it. Uh, so cats take up um, a large percentage of, and you know, every time there's, there's a, a school or a kid's group or whatever that goes up there, or they're doing some remote learning thing with a, with a, a classroom, um, the, you know, the cats are the first thing that, that the kids want to see. So it's a, it's a good doorway to the science, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Well, if you want to go ahead and do your next uh, presentation. Sure. And then we'll get on to some of the other questions uh, after you that. Gotcha. This is just a quick one, folks. Um, what I wanted to do, I want to give you some idea of what's of what's coming up. And, um, uh, you know, COVID has uh, forced, as you know, my fellow authors like Matt knows, um, you know, we're, we're we it has canceled, you know, uh, we, we were doing a lot of virtual events, but the virtual events never make up for uh, being there in person and shaking hands and being on tour and on the road for these books. So um, I've tried to use the time, um, the, the extra time that I've had not being on the road uh, to throw myself into projects. And I have a bunch of things coming and uh, I wanna show you, I wanna give you sort of an, a sneak preview of uh, some of the things that are coming. This will just be a couple of minutes. Um, Chris, am I back up with, uh, can you see the picture of me at the summit? Yep, you're good. Okay, cool. So um, here's the first project. Um, many of you in the past couple of months have, maybe past month or so, have seen shots of my daughter and rocks. This is Frog Rock in New Boston. So um, I've been wanting to take her here for a little while since I found out about this place. Uh, it really does look like a frog. Um, this is a, a rock that back at the turn of the century, the tourists would, at the big fancy hotels they would, uh, who were coming up from out of Boston and New York would go and picnic at this area. Um, it was all a bare summit at the time. And uh, I wanted to take her here just because I thought she thought it would be cool. And in fact, she loved it. This is one of her favorite places. And we've been back a couple of times. And so about a month ago, maybe a month and a half ago, <clears throat> we went out there. And one of the things she asked me was, Daddy, um, you know, what uh, are there any other rocks uh, in the shape of animals <laughs> that we can go visit? And, uh, I, you know, I so I went to find out. And as it turns out, there's a lot of rocks out there in New Hampshire. New Hampshire uh, and uh, has a thing for special rocks, I've come to realize. Um, there are dozens and dozens of named rocks, maybe hundreds of named rocks in the state. Um, some are historic, some are part of the you know larger parks like the Pawtuckaway, uh, Boulder Field and so forth. Um, Madison Boulder, let's see, I have a shot of him. Here's Madison Boulder, there she is, visiting Madison Boulder for the first time. So um, we started visiting a couple of these rocks and it occurred to both of us that there was no list. There was no you know 52 at the view list or 
um, you know, 4,048, you know, you know, 48, 4,000 footers list or um, the terrifying 25. There was no rock list, which seemed insane because there's so many of them. And um, some of them are in such interesting and historic areas. Some of them require pretty significant hikes. Glen Boulder, for example, uh, uh, up uh, in the notch there. Um, so we set out, we've set out in the course of the past month to create the field guide, the field guide for New Hampshire rocks. And we're calling it uh, the New Hampshire rocks that rock 25. Um, there's going to be 10 drive ups, uh, 10 short hikes. And then you're going to be able to select from a list of 15 others. Um, so of an optional five of the 15 others uh, to create your 25 list. We're building a Facebook page uh, for it. And we're going to have a field guide and a patch you can earn and a certificate. So um, our hope is that we're going to launch this on the first day of summer. That's my hope. So June 22nd, um, everything is going to come together uh, perfectly and we're gonna have it all available. And uh, <laughs> that's, I'm optimistic about this. So that's our, that's our first, um, our first, the first project that's happening. There's, there's my daughter again at, uh, at uh, Madison Boulder. Um, now these rocks, can anybody tell me what they see in this rock? I don't want to give it away. Anybody tell me what they, what they see? You can, you, this, is, uh, my, this is my daughter's creation. This is her find. Um, this is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle Rock. It is in Auburn up on Mine Hill. And it's a nice short hike. Uh, she discovered him, I did not. So this is her rock. Um, I'm telling it to you now for the first time. So it's, uh, so, so, so let it leave my lip so let it be. So it is now Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle Rock. So that's going to be on the list. So the, um, the second project that Chris alluded to is coming September 9th. We have a September 9th launch. It's called Stories of the White Mountain. Uh, in, in writing the book, The White Mountain, there, were, um, there, there was an enormous amount of uh, content that never made it into the book, as happens with all nonfiction books. And uh, some of that, some of those stories um, have been published since in AMC or in Appalachia. Um, some of them have never been published again. Some of them are being reworked. For example, um, the chapter on, on Alton Weigel and the chapter on Barbara um, uh, Peterson in, uh, in the White Mountain are being reworked and added to and streamlined a little bit, sort of you're going to be getting a, a kind of new and improved version uh, of those stories. And some of them have never been written. For example, I'm doing a story on uh, Daniel Rossiter, the, uh, uh, the photographer, famous cog photographer who was killed in 1929 um, in the first uh, pepper sass accident. That's going to be a brand new story. And of course, the cat mascot story, that's going to be new. And the story on this guy, I'm sure some of you recognize um, the, the famous Marty Ingstrom, broadcaster up at the summit of Mount Washington for nearly 40 years. Uh, here he is in a great uh, portrait by a, uh, my friend Peter Bosco. And here's Marty in his home. I actually had the great honor um, of spending a weekend up with Marty. He lives in uh, Sherbert, Sh um, Freiburg, Maine, um, in, in an old farmhouse that's been in his family for years and years and years. And um, I'm doing a, a story and a feature on, on, uh, on Marty, and that'll appear in the new book. And there's the old snowcat that Marty used. This is the snowcat uh, that this, this picture is from the 50s. The snowcat was used uh, by Marty and his, uh, his TV crew for a couple of decades uh, to get up the mountain. And believe it or not, um, I found it. <laughs> and here it is in a junkyard down in, uh, down in Massachusetts, near Arlington, Massachusetts. Um, that is the original snowcat that Marty used to go up the mountain. Um, it, it still turns over, believe it or not. That engine still works. Uh, it obviously is not drivable anymore. You, you'll, you'll hear about that in the book. Um, and here's a, a couple of shots because it's so popular. This is Tiki. This is the first uh, cat mascot of Mount Washington. That's Sal Pagliuca um, holding her, one of the founders. Here's a, this is Blueberry. Uh, one of the cats from the 70s. I believe this is 1972. That's the famous Nin, one of the friendliest cats that uh, was ever the mascot up there. And there's, uh, uh, there's Adam, one of the observers holding, uh, holding Marty. So we're going to do the history of the cat mascots. That'll come out in the book too. 
So um, uh, one of the other stories that'll be in the book is the famous Mount Washington Tower. A lot of people don't realize that for uh, nearly 25 years, 22 years, there was an enormous uh, tower at the summit, right over the summit cone of Mount Washington. There's a picture of it there. Uh, that tower even had a, a huge spotlight that apparently could shine for nine miles. People at Fabian's uh, would be able to read in the light of that, uh, of that spotlight from the tower. So I'm going to be telling that story. Then in the um, late winter of next year, so hopefully end of February, early March 2022, um, my guide in history of New Hampshire fire towers will come out. Uh, there's the cover. Uh, that, was, that book was supposed to come out this year, uh, but my publisher, um, because of COVID, and uh, I agree with the decision, um, I need to tour for this book. So um, we're going to wait until next year to release that one. And then uh, finally, in uh, spring of 2023, I have a, a history of uh, World War II uh, in the White Mountains. Um, that's going to be published. That's also going to be through Hobblebush. Um, and it's going to tell the story of some things like, for example, this is a, the old Navy hangar that used to sit at the summit of Mount Washington. This picture is from the, from the 50s, uh, but this picture is from the 40s. Uh, this is an old phantom, phantom jet that was pulled up on a flatbed in 1947 to do icing experiments, to wing icing experiments. And there's the tip-top house uh, with a laboratory attached to the back of it uh, that the Navy would do those experiments on. Another thing that happened during World War II, this is uh, um, Turkey Pond in uh, Concord. <clears throat> and I'm actually going to finish my presentation with a quick reading. Um, about the Lady Log Rollers in uh, 1942 um, on Turkey Pond in Concord. So here we go. In a newsletter from November 1942, the United States Forestry Service referred to an experiment, experiment taking place on the shores of Turkey Pond in Concord, New Hampshire, as going along nicely. It is most surprising and gratifying to see the way those gals take hold of the job, the breathless article writer explained. In addition to the jobs we anticipated women could handle, we have found them capable of rolling logs on the deck, running the edge, and for show purposes, even running the head saw. Maybe it will be possible to actually man a mill 100% with women sometime in the future. Imagine. Turns out for two years between 1941 and 1943, while most men were away at war, the USFS built a sawmill on the northern edge of the pond and hired nearly only women to operate it at the starting at the startling for its time wage of four dollars a day. The mill was updated with state of the art safety equipment and rigged with auto chain auto saw and chain drives so that there would be no heavy lifting or pulling for the feminine crew. When government photographer John Collier traveled to Gorham to photograph Barbara Mortison and her fire tower, he also spent a few days in Concord to take some remarkable shots of what were then called the Lady Log Rollers. And here's one of my favorite photos. Um, this photo is titled Ruth DeRoach and Norma Webster, 18-year-old pit women relaxing after lunch. That's one of my favorite shots. Uh, of, of that series. So um, that'll be part of the book that'll be coming out uh, in 2023. So I just wanted to give you um, sort of a heads up of some cool things that are coming. Um, and certainly if, if you want to, um, we're going to have a, we're going to do a, pr a probably a pre-sale for the field guide, maybe in a couple of weeks, if I can really get my act together. Um, uh, we'll see about that. But, um, you know, I also have a, um, a newsletter, a monthly uh, email newsletter that goes out. Uh, so if you want to be involved with that, certainly send me your um, email and I'll put you on that list. Um, so there's there's a lot of cool things happening. Um, probably more, I've probably bitten off more than I can chew like usual, but um, you know, I like to keep busy. <laughs> well, you'll have to let us know when, uh, when you're going to put it up for 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 advanced ordering because we'll definitely put it up on ours for ours and you know of course there's a lot of other um uh independent bookstores around the, the state that you have your books in gibson's being one of the biggest there right there in concord and the bookery in manchester and i'm sure there's a whole bunch more too so you could always uh if you're in one of those areas of course we'd love you to buy it from us but um we understand no we'd love you to spread the uh 
spread the wealth around the other independent bookstores. So you mentioned, um, actually, real quick, one more question I wanted to mention, yeah. uh, ask about Mount Washington was you had uh, mentioned way back at the beginning about um, how more extreme the weather has become uh, over the years. Do you believe that that's climate change related? Yeah, well, I mean, in a in a way, it doesn't matter what I believe. The observers believe it, you know. Um, I mean, I uh, I asked most of them um, exactly that question, and over the past couple of years, uh, what what they are seeing is that the warm the the hotter days are getting hotter, and the colder days are getting colder. Um, in fact, a really funny thing happened, um, and I'm I'm going to get the I'm going to get the temperature wrong here, but the uh, not last year. So this would have been 2019. So whenever there's um whenever the the observatory thinks that a record of some sort is going to be set word goes out to observers and a lot of observers um who maybe they have the day off or whatever but they like to actually be at the observatory when when the observatory hits a particular record so uh, last summer 2019 the temperatures were going up and up and up as july and is getting into the high 60s i believe the highest temperature Mount Washington ever reached is 71, 74, something like that. And they thought they were going to beat that. They thought they were going to beat it. They thought they were going to beat the, the high temperature. Um, so one of the observers that I know actually called me <laughs> and said, hey, do you want to be here for that? And I was too far away, unfortunately. Um, so I wasn't able to make it. And it, they missed it by, I believe, a degree. Um, but this was a very, this is a really unusual experience. So yeah, so um, you know, most of the meteorologists up there will will simply, you know, as they did to me, for me, show you the numbers um, and just say, look, you know, we are getting more more wind and more cold and we're getting more more rain and more lightning. And we're just we're seeing over the course of the last 10, 15 years, it's all the extremes have gotten more extreme. Yeah. Now, quite a few years ago, maybe it's not quite a few years ago at this age, years run together. <laughs> um did wasn't there um wasn't there a mountain somewhere that tried to take the um the the the, the highest wind speed uh record away from mount washington at one point well technically technically <laughs> so mount washington holds the record for the highest ground wind speed measured by man right the highest ground wind speed measured by man um at 231 miles an hour there is there was a higher wind speed um on an unmanned buoy off the coast i believe of australia um that uh that in a cyclone that registered a higher wind speed as you know as, come on that doesn't count that doesn't these count. guys these guys did it <laughs> you know <laughs> in person so yeah so it's um you know you know there's been higher wind speeds but mount washington still holds um the the Measured by man, wind speed. Yeah, if they want, if they want that record, or they want to impress me, put a person out on that buoy when that wind hits, right, and then, exactly. uh, then we'll count to, it. But uh, have so I have, <laughs> I have somebody asking, how can you sign up? Uh, how can people sign up for your uh, your newsletter? The best way to do it would be I'm putting my email right in the thing right now. Just send me an email, and I'll get you in there. There you go. There you go, dansesney at gmail.com. Of course, his website is dansesney.wordpress.com. Um, you can also... Uh, let me put the website in there, too. There we go. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, all those good ones there. So uh, so you mentioned COVID. So let's go back and talk about COVID a little bit. Yeah, it's yeah. definitely been a rough 15 months or 14 months or so with the pandemic. Of course, we can't do in-person things. Hopefully, people getting vaccinated, which I have my second shot tomorrow. I have my so, second Friday. Nice. Well, hopefully, uh, <laughs> hopefully we won't have to close the store over the weekend because right. I've been hearing some things about the second shot and I'm a little, little worried, but we're going to get it done <laughs> so that we can start having in-person events and stuff. And we most definitely want to have you back, but yeah. um, let's talk about um, uh, uh, COVID and your poetry. You write poetry as well. And you have okay. a couple of poems in a brand new uh, book published by Hobblebush. And yep. they're actually asking for submissions for a second edition. Yep. Uh, our second book, uh, but it's called COVID Spring. Talk about that for a little bit. Yeah, here it is, COVID Spring. Let's see the cover. So um, the uh, state poet laureate, Alexander Perry, uh, got together with my publisher, Hobblebush. Um, this was, so I, I, this is, when did this come out? This is late, 
early summer last year, right? Um, and they put out a call for um, for poets to contribute to to this collection called COVID Spring, and uh, they we are right in the middle right now of a second call for a COVID Spring two. If there are any poets out there, Mary, I'm seeing you here. Uh, if there are any poets out there who want to contribute um, to uh, volume two of this, and the the um, the call was really simple. Um, how you know poetry ab about the pandemic? That's it. You know how has the pandemic affected you? Um, you know what are what 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 sort of uh, insights um, did the the poets have? And I was honored to have one of my poems selected. Um, you know it was a, it was a blind selection, so. Um, I was really grateful that uh, that I mean the poet laureate of all people. Again, I don't consider myself to be that great of a poet, but um, I I uh, I got a poem in there, and I and I just actually sent my um, my entries out for the, for volume two. So fingers crossed. Um, but it's a it's an excellent collection. Um, it's um it's so insightful. Uh, you know, Chris. I mean, you know this. It's we are. It's one thing. You know, I talk a lot about um, you know mindfulness and. And being in the moment, my friend Matt knows knows a lot about that, and and Rick does too, about being in the moment, um, and how important that is, uh, you know, to your to your life and to just your everyday practice of well being. And the pandemic has has forced us to be mindful, <laughs> right? It's it's a forced mindfulness, you know. And when you're when you're forced to do something, it never works. <laughs> Right. No matter what, how good the intentions are, um, um, being being forced to be present every day is uh, uh, can can get uh, can wear on you after a while. And I think, uh, you know, we're we're all feeling the effects of uh, this is going to be this is going to be um, 15 months that, uh, you know, that that are that we will never forget. <laughs> we're going to be talking to our grandchildren ab about this past year. You know, um, it's going to be one, you know, there's going to be a lot of history books written about it. So, uh, you know, we're, we are going, you know, it's, I know it's, it's cheesy to talk about, you know, th these, these unusual times or these, uh, but this is something, this is unlike anything generationally that, that we've ever experienced. So um, I, I think these poems are the, the collections are a way and the poetry for me, you know, writing poetry for me is almost a therapeutic therapy for me is almost therapeutic. It's sort of a way for me to, uh, to sort of express, you know, sometimes frustration, um, and, uh, um, in a way that's healthy <laughs> as opposed to unhealthy, <laughs> you know? Uh, so, um, yeah, so it's been good. It's been good for me. I've, I've written more poetry this year than I've probably, than I would, I normally would ever have. And part of it is because it's a, it's a quick streamlined way for me to, to just sort of, um, emote. Yeah. Yeah. I went through a hard time, uh, a decade or so ago and, and I found, started writing, po writing poetry and Ooh. I don't share a lot of it, but it was more for myself. Yeah just to get some of the anger, some of the frustration of, of the times and, you know, personal, political, environmental, everything just kind of was, was going on. And, and I found it very cathartic to, uh, to uh, get all that out on paper because yeah. sometimes it's just hard to talk to people who don't understand, you know? Yeah. So let's see. So one other book that I'd like to, to touch on is uh, you wrote a book called the, the Nepal Chronicles um you spent a month it's a month about a month long uh trek uh to the everest base camp and your marriage and work in nonfiction again um i mentioned you telling me a story one time that um i believe your daughter took her first steps or her first words uh over in that area yeah so uh yeah yes Two, two different stories, two different books. Um, so we were married. Uh, my wife, my wife was uh, born in Nepal, uh, raised in Chicago, and um, we met here. And when we got married, uh, we her it was actually her uh, my father in law who suggested we go to Nepal and have a traditional Nepali wedding in Kathmandu. And uh, you know, uh, 
I, I had, I had no idea what any of that meant at the time, but uh, I said yes immediately <laughs> and off we went. And for our honeymoon, um, we spent, uh, turned out to be about three weeks, three, a little over three weeks in the upper Himalayas in the Kumbu uh, Valley, which is the Mount Everest region, trekking up to Mount Everest base camp. It was just the two of us. We didn't, we weren't guided um, and we weren't part of a, part of any trekking team. So we stayed in, you know, Nepali homes and tea houses and so forth along the way. Um, we could come and go as we pleased. And uh, it was uh, an absolutely extraordinary, life-changing experience. And um, I, was, I, you know, took notes and journals. And, um, you know, I had never, I'd been all over Europe but prior to that, uh, but I had never, never been to Asia. This is the first time that I'd ever been to to, to Asia and, and first time that I'd ever been to a developing country. And um, it was uh, uh, just an, a wonderful and shocking uh, experience for me. And, uh, you know, I consider Nepal and Kathmandu to be my second home. I love it there. We've been back since. And that was where um, uh, my, the, the story about my daughter came up. Um, in 2015, we when she was 10 months old, we, uh, along with my father and mother-in-law, uh, took her, went overseas again to visit her great-grandmother. My, it would be my daughter's great-grandmother, who lives in northern India. And we spent, uh, that was also about a month, where we went to India. Um, I went back to Kathmandu for a week or so, and then we went to Turkey in, uh, in Istanbul. And it was in Istanbul, in uh, Hagia Sophia, which is the great, well, it was a cathedral and then it was a mosque and then it was a museum and now it's a mosque again uh this in, in, incredible 2000 year old um building where she took her first steps inside Hecky, in istanbul so you know now I, I can say you know whenever anyone asks me where my daughter walked first it was in it was in, in istanbul <laughs> how about that <laughs> um so that's what uh, invisible one that was where my collection of poetry came out of out of that particular trip yeah, we have that book. Uh, we have the uh, the Nepal Chronicles too. Uh, what are a couple of the other ones, Judah? Uh, you have a lot of books. Yeah. <laughs> well, I did a book on Alaska uh, called uh, Mosquito Rain, which is a uh, uh, a collection of essays. Um, uh, before my daughter was born, my wife and I spent three weeks um, living out of the back of an SUV in Alaska, just tooling around Alaska. We went all the way up to the Arctic Circle and um uh denali and um um uh, valdez we spent a couple of days in valdez so that's a collection of essays um my first book was the adventures of buffalo and tough cookie which is uh with my other daughter my first daughter janelle her and i spent a year in the white mountains um hiking the 52 with the view mountain list um so we wrote uh i wrote about that experience and uh what am i missing oh i have a collection of of short fiction called sing which is uh Basically, just short fiction from one of the oldest sh stories in there is from high school, not high school, from college, all the way up to, uh, you know, current. So it's a, a collection of a, a fun collection of fiction. And uh, I have a lot of um, I have a lot of 99 cent shorts um, that I sell up on Amazon, just short stories or or short pieces. For example, I was I actually was a writer in residence for the Cog Railway for um, a, a week when uh, Pepper Sass went on tour to Philadelphia and to, to Scranton. Uh, so I have a piece on, on that uh, up on Amazon. So weird little things like that. I know I should, I shouldn't, I, I apologize for mentioning the A word. <laughs> I was just going to say you get, everybody gets one time that they can use the, 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 the A word, the, that company that shall not be named. Yes. And then after that it's forbidden, I but anyways, no, no. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, I think we've got, um, uh, pretty much uh, a, a few copies of all those books. Of course, if you, if you come into the store, they're scattered around because some are in the poetry section, some yeah. are in the fiction, uh, the nonfiction <laughs> section, the, the history section stuff. So you kind of have to, but if you ask for it, I know where they are. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, so your youngest daughter, when you were doing the fire tower tour, uh, what does she think of that going to all the fire towers? And Oh, she loves, she loves it. She, she loves it because um, she likes having a destination. You know, she's she's very much a um, and I don't know if she probably gets it from her mother, but she's very much a a um, a goal oriented kid. 
So just walking to a place and then turning around and walking back, that doesn't appeal to her very much. Um, but if there's a thing there, when she gets there, that's a whole different story. So um, actually walking up, you know, hiking up to these actual towers and then being able to climb the towers. Um, and she loved, you know, we would climb up to the, the thing that she would like to do the most is we'd climb to the highest platform and we would, we would have our picnic. We'd have treats up at the highest platform. And this was, this was the thing that she always wanted to do. And, you know, it was, um, we started in, uh, oh, I'm, losing, I'm losing track of time. We actually started in 2019, you know, um, just as some fun hikes to do. And, uh, you, you know, again, it, it sort of evolved organically. She actually earned her hiking patch when she was four and a half years old. And um, when we got, we, we only need five in order to earn the patch. So we knock those out of the park pretty quick. And then COVID hit. And, uh, you know, we had, you know, it was winter and I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to, we weren't ready to do winter hiking yet. And then COVID came in March and April and thing, you know, nobody knew what was happening or whether you could go hiking or it was safe outside or not safe outside or whatever. So we put it off until the summer of 2020 getting the rest of them and um by that time you know we learned that it was it was okay you know to to do some local hiking to do some smaller hikes so uh, we knocked the rest of those off over the course of a, a couple of months and we got all 15 of them and she she finished the list uh and uh now we're doing um we're we're besides the rocks i we're working on so many lists uh there's actually a so there's 15 active fire towers but there's 85 either former fire towers or observation fire towers on a secondary list. So there's 100 total. So we're working on the 100 fire towers list now. Um, because even if there's no actual fire tower up there, she likes looking at the footings or, or finding the remains or whatever. So uh, it's always about you know, getting up there and, and having something at the end of the hike for her to do. That's what she likes I haven't, most. I haven't been up there in a while, but the one here in Dover, um is that still climbable yeah that's uh, garrison hill, garrison right? hill. You're, yep. you're talking about yeah um uh that yes and in fact uh <laughs> garrison hill is an interesting one it, the reason it's on the fire tower list, it was never designed to be a fire tower i mean it's a it's an old fire tower it's been there for in one version or another for 100 years but it was originally designed as as an observation tower is a tourist draw. There's even a restaurant at the bottom of it. At one time, you'd go and you'd eat a you know, sandwich and have coffee, and then you'd pay ten cents and you'd climb up to the top. And then that burned down. And then they built the the, the current version, the the beautiful iron one. It looks like a looks like a space station up there. But yeah, that's on the list. And you can go up there. You can. It's not. Uh, it's open anytime. There's, uh, you know, they try to take care of it. Unfortunately, there's a fair amount of graffiti up there. But um, yeah. So, so yeah, so you can go up there. Yeah, we were up yeah. there. Um, her and I did that, we climbed that one, uh, uh, I want to say late fall of last year. Yeah. yeah, we can't have anything nice anymore, can we? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, I have a question from Matt um, Is where, uh, where there's smoke a narrative or a guidebook? Uh, that's the Fire Tower book. The answer is yes. <laughs> it's um, so uh, I'm, a, I'm not a big, like you know a trail guide writer guy i love using them i love maps and i love using them um but i'm not i'm not really big on writing them um so when i was talking about this book with with my publisher it's going to be Boncliffe books by the way it's not going to be hobblebush for this one when i was talking with my publisher about that um i said to him well i i'm really interested in the history of fire towers because it's a very important it's a really important history and there's so many like weird quirky parts of it, like the Smokey the Bear campaign and um, a Croydon fire tower, which is Corbin Park, which is that the mysterious hunting preserve up there in, in Croydon. There's so many of these aspects of the of the history. And also, you know, what was really popular when I did my book with Janelle, it was very much a, a narrative. It was very much of a, a bonding book of her and I learning to be father and daughter. And, and, I, and I like writing all that stuff, but at the same time, you know, I want people to be able to pick the book up and if they want to climb a fire to a particular fire tower to be able to to figure out how to do that, to know where the trails are and how to get to the trailheads and all that stuff. And I said to him, I said to Mike, you know, I don't know 
I don't know what direction I should go in, in order to, to make this book work. And uh, he just laughed and he said, just go in all those directions. <laughs> so, so it's going to be all of that, Matt. Um, there is going to be uh, information on how, how to climb to the fire towers, uh, but there's also going to be a, a good amount of history and personal stories. Uh, the section where I climb with my daughter is going to be written very much in the vein of Buffalo and Tough Cookie, of her and I tackling this project together. Uh, there's going to be a whole section, a whole chapter dedicated just to Corbin Park and uh, Croydon Fire Tower. Um, there's going to be a, an entire chapter on uh, the fire towers and um, the Forest Service's response uh, to 9-11, believe it or not, which is um, going to be a really interesting chapter. Um, there's a, a whole separate chapter on the Smokey the Bear campaign on the history of fire towers uh, um, in the Forest Service uh, fire towers. So there's, there's going to be a lot in there. Yeah. We have a book uh, by Michael Bruno. He's, he lives up in Bethlehem, New yeah. Hampshire. He wrote a book uh, that we have in the store called Cruising New Hampshire History, a guide to, um, I don't remember the rest of it, but it's, it's, it's about all the, um, the, the historic signposts that you see on the side of the roads and the highways and stuff. He's got 200 some odd, 250, 60 some odd um, uh, ones in there. So each one, he's got a picture of the sign. He's got the lat long, he's got crossroads, he's got landmarks, and then he has an expanded history with what's on the sign. Did you think of doing anything like that with the Fire Tower book or is it gonna kind of morph in it or are you gonna have something maybe in the back as an appendix? Yeah, we're gonna do two things. So in the in the section where um, I'm climbing with my daughter, at the end of each of those chapters, there's going to be a, a sort of a how-to section. If So you wanna climb, you know, Mount Kearsarge Fire Tower. This is where the trailheads are. This is where you go to climb. This is the trails you can take. Here's the Here's the mileage and so forth. So if you want to, if, you know, if people are looking to climb the active fire towers, they're going to be able to turn to a chapter uh, and they're going to be able to see how to get there and how to do it. And then in the back, um, you know, like most guidebooks, I'll, we'll have an actual list that you can actually, you, so you'll be able to use it as a field guide. Well, there'll be an actual list. You'll be able to check it off. Um, so, so yeah, so it, it uh, there'll, there'll be, there'll be that. Same with the rocks book, by the way. Um, we're going to actually have a, you know, how to get there, um, you know, how to, you know, well, with the rocks book, in fact, I'm actually putting the GPS coordinates of each of the rocks. So people can just punch that right in and they'll be able to they'll track right, right to the individual rocks. Yeah. So when you're on top of one of the uh, fire towers, do you ever see a fire? <laughs> good, good question. Um, no, unfortunately. Well, I, I, I was going to say no, unfortunately, but actually it's fortunate. <laughs> it's a good thing that I never saw a fire. Um, but I got a lot of fire stories. You know, there's a lot of fire stories. And our, our most interesting one happened on Belknap, uh, up on the Belknap Fire Tower. Um, there's a long time, long time, you'll see, read about him in the book. His name is Hal. Um, he's been the fire tower watchman lookout. That's what his official title, lookout up at the Belknap Fire Tower for decades for 30 years and um we were um and i were lucky enough uh during our hike of belknap that he was actually there he was actually stationed at the tower when we were up there and uh so we got to talk to him and he showed us around and um uma by that time had had already been deputized as a junior fire ranger at red hill fire tower in moltenboro so she she takes this designation very seriously Whenever we're on the trails, she she tells everyone who passes us by that she's a junior fire tower ranger and, um, you know, tells them about the trails and uh, what things to watch out for and so forth. She takes this role very seriously. So you can imagine, you know, Hal's surprise when this little five year old, you know, is basically telling him how to do his job up in, <laughs> up in the Belknap fire tower. Hal's been doing this for 30 years, you know, um, but he loved it. He thought it was really funny. And he actually gave her a job. And he said, uh, so listen, if he, he, he gave her this pair, you know, we were all, we were all, you know, socially distanced and masked up and everything. It was, it was all very safe. And he gave her this pair of binoculars and he said, look through the binoculars. And if you look down the trail, a good hundred or so, a hundred, couple hundred yards, you can see these red things. There's these red things on this rock. And I, I can't tell what this is from up here. 
and I need somebody to go down and find those red things and bring me back a sample so I can see what's over there on the trail. He gave her a job and she went right after it. She just marched down the fire tower. She had her sample bag. I had trouble keeping up with her. She marched down the trail. She was, she was going to do this job. And we, it took us about 20 minutes to find this rock that we saw from up in the fire tower. And sure enough, there was a, um, red rose petals. Somebody apparently had a wedding or an engagement photo shoot on the day before or the couple of days before, and they left rose petals scattered all over the rock. And she very carefully plucked the rose petals. She put them in a little sample bag. She marched back to the fire tower and marched back up and handed Hal her, her job. And uh, task complete, he rewarded her with a pile of Smokey the Bear stickers and, and other nice. things. And uh, it was, uh, it was, a, it was an it was a pretty cool experience, you know, to actually uh, to see her engaged like that. So, yeah, that was yeah. kind of cool. That doesn't have anything to do with fire spell, but uh, no, I never saw no. fire spell up there. <laughs> when you were out uh, doing the rocks, um, what was the strangest thing or the most interesting thing that you came across? Like, did you find like an abandoned car or an abandoned plane wreck or something you know, out in the middle of the woods, out in the middle of nowhere? My goodness, we should do. Is Matt still here? Is, is Matt? Did Matt leave us? Did Matt leave us? I see. Oh no, Matt's still here. We should do. We should do a plane wreck. Uh, a plane wreck field guide. You know, it's it's a it's a popular subject on the hiking boards, um, and people love to hike up to. In fact, there's one up at on near Be the Belknap Fire Tower. Um, so, what was the question? Oh, the most unusual thing. Um, the the most unusual thing to me on this journey was. What I told her um, was that as we're doing this, I want her, you know, this is her book too. You know, she's she's going to have her name on, on the cover with me, you know. So um, what was important for me was that she name and discover a lot of these locations, you know. Like I, she, she wasn't going to go out and rename Madison Boulder, although she wanted to, <laughs> but you know, Madison Boulder is Madison Boulder. We can't rename it. Um, but there's a lot of these locations, you know, that that are only going to exist in this book. This this is going to be the, the first time these appear in a field guide as actual destination rocks like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle Rock, for example. That was her thing. So what was the what was the coolest thing that happened for me was that during one of our walks right here in Manchester, um, we were walking past a park uh, called Oak Park. It's up on the north side of the time. We, we've walked past this park, you know, a thousand times in, in her life. But this one time, because she knew we were writing this book, she ran up to this little rise and there's this series of rocks up on this little rise, series of boulders um, that kids play and she's played there a million times since she was born. But this, this time she said, you know what, daddy, these rocks look like the Loch Ness Monster's humps. <laughs> and I, I stepped back and she stood and she showed me she was like here's his head here's his middle hump and here's his tail and I was like okay we just found Nessie's humps so Nessie's humps are going to appear in the book um, as a as a new destination for us and that to me was that was the most fun um, that has been the most fun we haven't even gotten to them all yet but that has been the most fun for me is going out there with her and just seeing her like just like her her brain working, you know, like, oh, that, you know, it looks like this, or it looks like this. Like we went out to, um, we went out to Wyndham. There's a rock out in Wyndham called Indian Rock. And it's, uh, it's cool because it's, it actually predates Wyndham itself. And the Native Americans used this particular rock to grind the grain and flour in the rock. And you can actually see the pestle holes in this rock. It's a really neat thing. But it's a collection of rocks. There's like five total rocks in this little set. So we went out to visit Indian Rock and she named all the other four rocks. There's like pizza rock, there's cheese rock, there's kitten rock, there's, you know, she named them all. So now we have this whole set that she named, which I just, I love. And um, so, yeah, so that's, that was, that's, that's been the cool part for me. That's been a lot of fun. But I haven't come across, I haven't, I haven't come across any of it. Oh, actually, that's not true. Um, on Pawtuckaway, so this isn't a rock story, this is a fire tower story, but on Pawtuckaway, uh, up, if you go up to the fire tower on Pawtuckaway, uh, about maybe 30 feet off the south southeastern ledge 
is a car wreck. It's it's down in this little valley, and it, it's it's not easy to get to, but but you can see it from above, and um, I don't really know the history of it, but it is kind of cool to actually see these. Uh, there's there's uh, uh, an extraordinary amount of cars. <laughs> In the, in the woods of New Hampshire <laughs> that you that you wonder how the heck they got there and that's one of them so that's that's one that we did come across yeah so we're going to wrap this up here in just a few minutes we're starting to lose cool. people but so if anybody uh, has any last minute questions just throw them in the chat here uh, real quick have you ever taken your daughters to uh, American Stonehenge no um, not yet um, I I'm going to take them both uh, Janelle actually just graduated uh, not graduated what am I saying not yet um, she just finished her first year of college and she's, uh, coming up this summer, hopefully, um, once we're all vaccinated and then, uh, and then it, we'll, we'll go out to Stonehenge. I've been asked a lot of American Stonehenge is going to actually show up in the book. It's not. And the reason it's not is because I want all these places to be free. I, I want them to, you know, to be places where you don't have to pay to go, to go see the rocks. That's that's not a I'm not criticizing American Stonehenge, but I just wanted them to all be free locations. So it's not going to appear in the book, but we haven't been there yet. But it is someplace that it's one of those, you know, if, I've lived here for 20 years. I've never gone to American Stonehenge. So if any of you have gone there and you have any you know hints or advice for me, please let me know, because sooner or later, I'm going to have to make it out there. <laughs> so we'll make this our final my uh, the final question. Uh, have you ever thought of where you've done the mountains you've done in the woods with rocks and hiking and stuff? Have you ever thought of doing something uh, in the future about the, uh, the seacoast? Huh. Uh, nope. <laughs> <laughs> not, not yet. I, I, I you Could know, that's something that you'd be interested in or I, do you, do you like the mountains and the, I like, yeah, I like the mountains. I, you know, I have this, um, I have this conversation with my wife all the time. I, I think that there's, uh, uh, there's two types of people, right? There's two types of outdoor people, the ones that, that like water and the ones that like mountains. <laughs> and, then, and there's a few that like water and mountains. Um, but, uh, but I, I will tell you a funny story though. So, um, uh, when, not when I first moved here, but a couple of years after I moved here, I was working in York, Maine. And, um, the newspaper that I, and, and I was helping to edit a newspaper down there. And it was basically just me and a couple of writers and we're right by the water. And there's the, there's that, you know, the York, Maine has all the, the cliffs there and you can walk along, the, you can do the cliff walk and you can, and the water's down there. And I would go on these walks during um, my lunch breaks and so forth. And I recall very early in my employment down there going for a cliff walk. And it was really cool because I was actually able to sc scramble down from the cliffs and I was actually able to walk along the water and I could see all the all the, the exposed rock and everything. And, and I'm walking along just enjoying the views and the cliffs are on one side and the ocean is on the other side. And uh, I suddenly realized that the that my feet are now in water <laughs> and, and the water is, is going up. And uh, it was my it was my it was my first lesson in tides. <laughs> <laughs> how uh the tide was coming in and there i was you know with a 30 foot cliff to my left as the tides were coming in i had i hadn't checked the you know the the, the tide clocks and uh sure enough so i had to hustle uh and scramble up a cliff to get out of the way of the tides to get up uh, out of the water so uh, that's my that's my I'll, if i if i ever end up doing anything about the ocean i'd probably drown <laughs> <laughs> Well, our clock says it is time to go, but before we do, I just want to say thank you uh, to Dan again for for doing this. Um, good luck with all your books and, you. and the future books coming out, and we definitely will have you back, hopefully in person, to do this again. Yeah, let's um, do uh, let's do it in the fall. Hopefully, that would be great if we can. Yep, all safe most, by then. And... Most of Dan's books right now are uh, available uh, in our store and through our website. A, um, www.freethinkerscorner.com drop the a so just freethinkerscorner.com uh dan says is dan's and again you, there's a lot of local bookstores uh around the area that i'm i'm willing to bet have uh quite a few have copies of his books uh, you can also get them from hobble bush as well i would like to thank everybody who joined us on on zoom uh, we appreciate the uh, the contributions to this. It, it's, it does take a lot to to put these events together. Uh, thank you for buying his books. We've got a lot of good book sales 
uh, out of this for, for Dan and uh, everybody on uh, Facebook Live. Thank you for joining us as well. Uh, we had Tony Trembley, Carrie Moser was over there, oh, a couple cool. others uh, were watching. And um, if you can't get it from us or Dan or anybody else, please use bookshop.org. They're a company now that um, you can get majority of the books through. We partner with them or we're an affiliate of theirs. So any sales through our link to them, or you can choose the store you wish to, uh, to support, a portion of sales goes, goes to that store. Uh, so just another way. And they've been super, super helpful during this pandemic. They've been a lifeline, lifesaver for a lot of bookstores. So everybody who has used them uh, now and in the future, we really appreciate it. So um, again, finally, thank you, Dan. And thank you. Hope to see you soon. Thanks, everybody. And if you want to, um, if I didn't get to any of your questions or you have any follow up, um, I am the easiest soul on earth to reach on social media. Just reach out and and send me a hello and and I'm and I'll get right back to you. Great. Well, everybody have a good night. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate it.